we need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change. Urban scrapyards found on the fringes of cities like Accra in Ghana are often used as a symbol of today's wasteful economy. Mobile phones, laptops, computers, automobiles, even entire airplanes, for many, and our showcase in the media, present these as the, uh, the, the epitome of planned obsolescence and design gone bad. But my guest today has a story from these scrapyards, a story to tell, a story of incredible innovation, a story that really highlights that the extraordinary is possible. My name is Seb and I'll be your host for this session. And welcome to The Diff, the interactive online event series that explores the circular, circular economy and related topics and hosted by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And we really want to hear from you. We want your questions, your input. We've got DK with us for the next 30 to 40 minutes and, uh, and we want you to ask him your questions. And there are a couple of different ways you can do that. You can do that by commenting in the section on the thinkdiff.co website, which is just to the right-hand side of the video screen or just below. You can do that on the YouTube stream in the comments section on the right-hand side. Or you can do it by tweeting us using hashtag thinkdiff. So I'm joined today by uh, a designer, an architect, an assistant professor at Penn State University, DK Osio Asare. Um, and DK, I've teased the story a bit here, but um, I want you to tell us, because I know many of our viewers will be familiar with these images of maybe rubber being burned or tires being burned, um, but there's, a, there's actually something fundamentally deeper or different going on in many of these communities. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the critical thing to understand from the outset is that Places like Agwablushi or what is called Agwablushi Scrapyard is a scrapyard and not a dump. And a dump is sort of where you just leave things, you dump them and leave them sort of basically forever. But a scrapyard is actually an active site where things are reprocessed. Um, and the, the actual goal of a scrapyard is to recover materials out of end of life equipment in order to reuse those materials. So places like Agwablushi are actually maker ecosystems. And there's an entire community of people around these spaces who are not only collecting scrap and waste or what, what have you from around the city and around really the, the region, across sub-region of West Africa, and bring it into a place where these things can be dismantled and materials can be recovered, but it doesn't just end there. Those materials then are used to make new products, uh, which ultimately serve people around the city and around the region again. I'm going to horrifically mispronounce this, but Agblo Bloshi uh, is uh, in Ghana. Um, can you just tell us, I didn't actually intro that, that's, uh, that's one of these uh, of many that might be found in similar areas, scrap yards, for lack of a better word, in near Accra. Sure. I mean, again, it's always a bit strange with, with the Agblo Bloshi scrap yard because this is essentially what it's called. Although technically it's not actually in Agrivloshi. Agrivloshi is a kind of commercial district uh, in central Accra. And just across the street from Agrivloshi proper is uh, a neighborhood called Old Fadama. And Old Fadama is a very dense, very, very lively uh, neighborhood. On one hand, there's a, a slum community which has upwards of 50,000 people living in very close quarters on land reclaimed from the Oda River and the Kolebu Lagoon. Um, you also have what's essentially the city of Accra's wholesale vegetable market, uh, where until recently you could buy uh, yams, but you can buy onions, you can buy tomatoes, um, sort of, you know, very, very large scale um, uh, market selling produce, um, as well as other things you would find in that kind of a, of a context of a, of a market. And then you have the scrapyard, uh, which is sort of just also on the banks of the lagoon um, and where these materials are, are sort of taken apart and reprocessed. But you're absolutely right that a lot of people are so fixated on this one place that they talk about it as if it's the only place in the world that is like this. Um, when in reality, it's just a hub, a relatively significant hub in the West African context, but it's by no means a singular space. It's actually part of a distributed network 
which has these more these larger scale nodes that are sort of have a central position within cities but you can actually trace these to a much finer grain that virtually every neighborhood across Accra, across major cities in West Africa, you'll have these smaller points where, which are sort of the first points of collection where scrap is collected and processed at the neighborhood scale before it's ultimately sort of brought into these central hubs. And you've, you've painted your picture of Agroboshi as quite a vibe, you know, quite a packed, quite a vibrant, energetic place. And I guess what we're gonna be talking about throughout this, um, this session is, is a lot about entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism and um, you know, especially young people engaging with uh, the opportunities uh, that actually come from the scrapyard as well. Um, and uh, I guess my uh, question there is you talked a lot in your intro about or the, your initial response to my first question about making and maker spaces and what, I mean, what does that mean? What kinds of activities are actually happening? What are people doing and innovating with um, in places like this? Mm -hmm. So this is so important and again, something that we've been talking about really since we started this project uh, a number of years ago, but increasingly in the global north or in the west, everyone likes to talk about maker spaces or sometimes like a fab lab, uh, which are super exciting and very cool places because it's kind of an open community space where people can come and gain access to tools um, and equipment, especially tools for digital fabrication but they can also find a community of expertise and knowledge and learn from other people about how to make whatever, whatever it is that they want to make. Um, and so these are really incredible sort of spaces that have um, really a lot of opportunity, but what oftentimes people overlook when you come to a place like Ghana or a place like Accra is that there are massive spaces that are filled with makers that may not look like a fab lab that you might have in London or, or New York or San Francisco, but they're very active and very vibrant and there's a lot of sort of making happening and a lot of expertise. So that's one of the things that I find so fascinating about Agwabloshi, the scrapyard. As soon as you go there, you can just sense how alive it is. It's all kinds of noises, people banging things, taking things apart, making things, moving, going here and there. It's incredibly active and incredibly vibrant. Um, in terms of what people are making, again, because this is both a kind of maker ecosystem and a recycling hub, you have the sort of first step of making is actually reclaiming materials. So you'll have people taking apart uh, really anything you can find in a city and beyond, anything from old mining equipment uh, to transformers, photocopy machines, televisions, computers, uh, air conditioners, refrigerators. So there's a lot of kind of e-waste as they call electrical and electronic equipment, but there's also a lot of automotive scrap. And by weight, there's much more automotive scrap than kind of e-waste as you would typically imagine it. So you can see buses and trucks and lorries and cars being taken apart and all the materials separated out. So all the glass goes in one place, all the steel goes in one place, the various types of plastics are collected and sorted in one place. Um, aluminum, brass, etc. So all of these materials are segregated. And then, for example, in the case of plastics, they're typically sorted by type, sorted by color, washed, shredded, and then in some cases, even pelletized, which means, you know, they go through a machine and come out as little pellets, which can be sold to factories and used as feedstock for making new plastic chairs, new plastic buckets, new plastic uh, tables. Um, so in that case, you have materials that are recovered, which go sort of more or less back into the so-called formal industry, you know, it's, factories that are a bit larger. It sounds but extremely you also... organized when you, when you say it in that way, like that the brass is all put in one place, the plastics are all put in one place. Is, that, is there some kind of central um, organization there or is it, it, I mean, how does it actually work? So there are various layers of organization and they're very much operating through kind of social networks. Um, so for example, there's a scrap dealers association, uh, which represents, um, especially in particular kind of, uh, people working with metals, um, but sort of scrap in general, and they interface with the government, for example, but you also have a lot of sort of, um, on some level, smaller or more lightweight networks that are operating between, uh, according to kind of kinship patterns or, or friends or people that might come 
from sort of the same sort of hometowns, um, especially in the north of Ghana and that are now uh, sort of in Accra. So there's a lot of different networks that are overlaid, but very much based on um, who people know and who people trust and building kind of communities of participation around that. But in terms of the sort of overall level of organization, it's actually very similar to something which is often called emergence, which is to say that you can actually create organization or something which appears structured, not through a kind of top-down hierarchical centralized um, form of organization, but actually something which is much more bottom-up and grassroots. And so that's what you find. It doesn't mean that every single piece, all the glass is in one giant pile, but it means that you have a distributed sort of, uh, sort of a distribution of smaller scale operations that are collecting plastic or collecting steel or collecting aluminum. So it is distributed, but it's organized sort of across that network. So you were saying that one side of this is the sort of, you strip out the materials, reclaiming materials, and you were gonna go on and say, that there's another there's another type of innovation going on or other type yeah of so that that's the first step in a way it's kind of like when you go to a, a sort of car factory you know at the very beginning they're rolling out large sheets of steel and starting to stamp parts i mean the, the first sort of uh phase of, of the operation in a place like agalush is taking things apart in order to recover materials but at the same time people are also recovering components so they're looking for parts, especially, for example, in electrical and electronic equipment. So pieces of old computers that might still work, even though the computer doesn't. And these components are also collected and sold as, as used parts for repair outfits and for technicians that refurbish and repair all kinds of electrical and electronic equipment. So you have on another end, you have um, sort of refurbished products coming out, which are sold at a very affordable price point. Um, and that keeps products from sort of, again, being dumped um, and actually extends the life of, of, of these products for a longer period of time. Um, and also in some cases can make them more accessible to people that couldn't afford a brand new device. Um, but then what's particularly interesting is you also have a dimension of this where the materials are being transformed. Um, and so again, that happens on a level where you have a very large um, sort of uh, ecosystem or community of welders that make uh, equipment for actually household kind of kitchens and kitchens and cooking, but also more industrial scale. So very large sort of grills for restaurants and, and caterers. Um, and they, they oftentimes will use, you know, oil, old oil drums um, or radiators recovered from air conditioners or refrigerators. So repurposing parts of, of, of old equipment um, and then you also have on the sort of even more extreme end of transformation, you actually have um, sort of cottage industry uh, smelters who are actually taking, you know, aluminum, melting it down and casting it to make uh, parts for the building industry, sort of decorative um, components for fences, uh, but also casting things like cauldrons and pots and spoons that, that people buy just next door in the market. Do we have, uh, is there any indication of the scale of this activity, like how much it's happening, how much material, or how many people, or any, any indication of like the size of this? Sure. I mean, so typically in terms of the scrapyard, in terms of the scientific literature, usually the numbers are in order of magnitude about 5,000 people, sometimes as high as seven. One thing to keep in mind is that this, these, this sort of population is very much in flux. Not everyone is sort of based there all day long, every single day. You have definitely sort of iterant sort of, you know, people who are there for a period of time, they may go back to the North um, certain times of year to engage in agriculture. You may have people who are back in the scrapyard when they need to sort of raise money or when they don't have other opportunities. And then they kind of cycle out and work in other, other areas. So it's very dynamic population. Um, but again, you have a very sort of smaller core of people working in the scrapyard itself. But then as you zoom out from this uh, from the scrapyard into this broader maker ecosystem around, you have tens of thousands of people working everywhere from the Accra timber market, where you have micro manufacturing in the timber industry, uh, furniture, metalworking, machine making, uh, making welding machines, all the way over to Abasokai, where you have a kind of used car parts and sort of repair um, industry as well. So as you zoom out, um, the scrapyard is really uh, an engine, if you will, that supports uh, a much larger ecosystem with tens of thousands of people working in it. 
I mean, what's sort of really fascinating about this story is, you know, obviously, often modern products, you know, we talk, I mean, we talk about mobile phone having more gold in it per tonne than the ore that we're mining from the ground. Um, but, uh, at, you know, at the moment, there's an interpretation, or certainly um, you know, historically there's an interpretation that, uh, you know, it's not really economical to recover that material in an effective way. And obviously, what's happened underneath that uh, is is what we're talking about here, which is that there are entrepreneurs or communities or maker communities that are showing that it is possible to utilise that at, at another level. Um, and I want to get back to that theme, but I'm also, uh, and, and talk about, you know, what, what the system that this sits in and, and, and the role of waste, etc. But uh, before that, I'm sort of interested to know how we, what your role in, is in this and how, how I, I introduced you as a designer and assistant professor at Penn State University. And obviously we're talking about um, activity that's happening in, in Ghana. Um, well, how, how did you become interested in this area? What's your background that led you to being involved in this topic? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, I, I often call myself, I mean, I'm, I'm a Ghana American, so I'm, I'm a dual citizen of, of Ghana in the US. So obviously sort of the development trajectory of Ghana is very important to me. Um, I also um, am a co-founder and principal of a, of a design office called Lodo, Low Design Office. And we're based between Tema, Ghana, which is essentially the sort of twin city uh, with Accra, um, and as well as based in Texas. So for more or less the past decade, I've been based in, in Ghana, in Accra, Tema, um, and very much involved in sort of understanding the informal mechanics of the African city, trying to understand how innovation operates in the so-called informal sector or the sort of quasi-formal sector, the kind of in-between spaces at the grassroots. Um, and also very interested in uh, microtexture or microarchitecture, but small scale architecture that can be mobile and how that can actually be sort of understood as a sort of large, massively scalable um, infrastructure across Africa and the global south. That is to say, if you look at almost any city in Africa, you'll see many, many very small buildings that are built, owned, and operated by people who don't necessarily have that much sort of cash or monetary resource or po political power within the city. And so how can that be a space of design? So that's something I've been working on for, like I said, over a decade. Um, and in terms of the, the project AMP itself, the Equivolution Makerspace platform, really, we typically talk about the kind of starting point for that project being in December of 2012, um, I was one of three organizers of a, of a, of a session um, on the maker movement and building the maker movement in Ghana at, um, at Bar Camp Accra. And there are about two dozen people that participate in that conversation. And they're all sort of makers, people that like to make things, tinker, um, you know, interested in innovation. And we're invested in building the community and building the impact that, that it could have. And out of that conversation, everyone was really excited. And we were like, where should we start? And it was actually kind of bizarre. I mean, almost everyone was like, you know what? It really bothers me that we have this place called Akuloshi Scrapyard, where sort of our brothers and sisters um, sort of are in extremely vulnerable situation. And can we do something about that? And so out of that conversation, we said, yeah, let's do something. It might take some time, but let's try and develop something out of that. So subsequently, um, the, my co-founder Yasmin Abbas and I sort of started this initiative um, called AMP, which was really to try and bring different communities of young people together to understand how a sort of slightly more structured or um, sort of cooperative and collaborative approach to building kind of maker culture in Ghana could feed into the scrapyard and try to green some of the recycling practices happening there. So exactly what does that project do? Um, you know, can you tell our audience a bit about the connection you're making there between informal and formal? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, and I guess we'll talk about that this more. It's partly why I guess we're having this conversation is to unpack uh, this project because it's not a simple one thing. It doesn't lend itself to a very sort of succinct explanation. But at its core, it is, like I just said, about trying to bring together different groups of young people. 
um, in Ghana and now increasingly across West Africa. And I, I'll tell you why is that, you know, every year in Ghana alone, you know, over a million young people effectively enter the job market, which means, you know, they have to look for a job, but there's nowhere near enough jobs for them. So they essentially have to create their own jobs or create their own opportunities, create their own future. And the challenge that we've found, and I, I taught for a number of years also in Ghana, um, is that you have sort of kind of bizarre condition, which is that you have uh, sort of a good number of young people that have been fortunate enough to get, uh, well, to go to university and to have gotten, you know, a degree in, especially we focus on what people call the STEAM field. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And the schools in Ghana are quite good. And so these educations are, are quite strong, but there's a, a sort of very real bias towards sort of theoretical knowledge, which in Ghana people sometimes call book knowledge. So you know how to take exams and, and study for sort of tests very well, but not every sort of young person coming out of university feels super comfortable um, making stuff and sort of either building a business or building a product um, or developing something in a way with their hands. But on the flip side, you have a lot of other young people who did not go through sort of the same type of an educational uh, process um, and learned either through apprenticeship. So learning how to be a welder or a mechanic or a blacksmith or a mason by as a young person starting to work on the job site or work in a workshop and learn from effectively a master. Um, and that's not sort of book knowledge. It's, it's not technical knowledge in the same way. It's more what we like to call practical know-how. But they also oftentimes, even though they don't necessarily have as robust a kind of repository of technical knowledge, um, they have a very incredible ability to figure things out and a kind of fearlessness to try. And so typically these two communities of young people have very little to do with each other because of class biases, ethnic biases, et cetera. And so really the starting point was to say, can we bring these two communities of young people together to make stuff and, and have fun together? And then sort of out of that, try to sort of um, upskill and upscale uh, different approaches to technology culture. And what, and what does that actually look like? Is that partnerships with schools, for example, or um, partnerships with or working with the communities that are based around Agla Bloshi? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know how, how, do, how do the mechanics actually work for it and how, how hard was it to convince um, you know, a, a, a one of the universities that you were mentioning there to, you know, to send their students to some kind of mm -hmm. collaboration in this? Mm -hmm. So definitely, I mean, we've collaborated with lots of schools. I mean, all the major universities in Ghana, um, but we've also collaborated with schools in, in Paris, uh, in the US, in France. Um, so really it's been a collaboration between um, very much young people in Ghana, in West Africa, um, as well as in Europe and the United States. Um, but that's really just part of it because again, our focus is really at the grassroots. So sort of after a kind of year long community building process and um, engaging stakeholders uh, very much in the scrapyard itself and around the scrapyard, we then um, collaborated with young people in the scrapyard to build and install a makerspace in the scrapyard. And so that was has been very much um, over these years, the, the base of our operations, which was not just kind of getting young people around the world to sort of understand some of the issues and sort of care and try to do something, but actually getting people into the scrapyard um, and to have maker workshops in this space as a way of understanding what's happening, but also beginning to imagine um, other possibilities and alternative futures for that space. So, so far we've worked with over 2000 young people um, and about half of them are what we call sort of grassroots makers. So either scrap dealers working in the Agbochi scrapyard or in the kind of ecosystem in this sort of immediate context in Accra. And then another thousand um, sort of students recent graduates and young professionals in STEAM fields of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. That's good. We've had a couple of questions in from the website. Thank you very much for those, Peter. He's, he just wants, they go back a little bit in our conversation, but there are clarification points that maybe other viewers are also 
asking his first question is, um, you know, he, he comments that it sounds like repair and recycling sector is sort of clean and thriving, um, but is there really no burning happening there, no dumping? Because I guess he's referring a bit to the images he sees. So the question about the balance there. And then his follow-up question is, um, you know, where where is the scrap actually coming from? Is that local to Accra? Is that across West Africa? Is that from other um, other other countries and different continents? Mm -hmm. Sure. So these are great questions, and um, there's definitely burning happening. So I never said there isn't, and there's definitely a lot of really horrific environmental pollution, and that's I guess I didn't explicitly state it, but that was also very much the motive for even beginning this project because, um, you know, young people are dying uh, from cancer, other kinds of sort of health problems. And there's some really devastating environmental pollution, which is happening, which ultimately affects everyone in the world because cycles of water and air means that the pollutants that are sort of released into the environment in places like Agbalushi ultimately move around the world. So in a way, we're all in this together. Um, so. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's like people say, you know, have you ever seen a coin with only one side? So there are a lot of problems in Agabloshi, but it's also the most sort of vibrant and robust uh, recycling sort of system that exists within the city of Accra. So until there's something else which can sort of support it or partner with it, um, we've been focused on how can we build up uh, the people working in these spaces um, continue to sort of support sort of broader um, and deeper kind of environmental awareness, but also try to think about how they that we can support them to do what they're doing in better ways. So as part of that, um, we've been working over a number of years on different kinds of tools and equipment to avoid burning. So we actually started with um, uh, Hal Watts in, in the UK actually had developed a kind of uh, copper shredder. And so we actually, a number of years back with uh, ReSciHub, another kind of group interested in this kind of activity, we actually sort of, you know, tested that. We built the, we assembled the prototype, tested it in, in Agriloshi, got a lot of, sort of user feedback. And then based on that, have actually been working on other sort of small scale um, uh, 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 tools and equipment that can be used for uh, recovering copper without burning it. So that's still very much um, uh, one of the sort of tool sets within the makerspace that continues to be under development. Uh, we were working that again on that again just like a month ago. So again, this is very much part of the focus is how can we um, address these issues. We also worked a lot on um, making videos actually, as well as paper manuals, but that has sort of limited meaning in the context of Agavaloshi, but also videos that are in the language that a lot of these people are speaking to talk about some of the challenges that are happening there. So. All of that is very much part of, uh, in a way, what we've been working at, working on and what we're trying to do. The burning happens. I will say, um, you know, I've been in the scrapyard countless times when uh, foreign news media outlets have come. Um, and I've actually had some sort of very extreme conversations with them because they are so focused on getting really graphic images of young people burning in order to sort of grab eyeballs and make ad money on their on their sort of online media, that that's the only part of the story they want to show. And they, in many cases, actually go and pay the young guys to really add fuel to the fire, literally. Um, even like, you know, petrol and add things just to make the fires larger and more intense to get more intense photographs. So I just want to point out that the international news media not all of them, obviously, but definitely some of the more unscrupulous sort of people have been very real participants in um, uh, contributing to this in, in a way that they obviously don't talk about. On the flip side, in terms of where the um, where does the scrap come from? So the original narrative was that this was all scrap that was dumped from the global north, arriving in shipping containers in Agwiloshi and then all being burnt. And that that sort of myth has very much been disproven. Um, I mean, the scientific literature increasingly is talking about the fact that the, the majority of sort of used electrical and electronic equipment coming into Ghana is not actually e-waste, it's not scrap. Um, it's actually very much in terms of the used equipment, these are actually um, uh, you know, things that get repaired if they need to be or refurbished. 
and then are resold. So the vast majority in terms of what's coming into the country is not just pure scrap. It's not going immediately to the scrap yard. Um, so increasingly, the scrap that you find in agroindustry is technically classified as internally generated, which means it's either coming from new equipment that was purchased and used by somebody in Ghana or the West African subregion, or it's um, coming out of a refurbished piece of equipment that has been used for any number of years before it finally met its end of life. So simply to say again, yeah, this is part of a much larger uh, network across the city and across the country and across the West African subregion of tens of thousands of small scale electrical and electronic uh, sort of technicians who repair and refurbish equipment that was purchased new or was brought in secondhand and extend these products over as long a lifespan as possible before finally they end up in the scrapyard. In a moment, I want to talk about some bigger picture topics. I want to ask you about what your biggest challenge was. I want to talk about, uh, you know, the, the long term vision and uh, and some of the system sits around. Before we do that, I'm just going to pass over to my colleague Lou. This uh, this session sits within three days of intensive diff activity, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what else you can find. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining this brilliant session with our guest, DK Oseo Osare. I'd just like to take a minute to talk about some upcoming sessions at this diff. To close this first day with a bang, we'll be discussing using fire to cool the earth through the use of biochar, and that's at 4.30pm BST. And we continue our journey tomorrow. Tune in at 12pm BST to learn how open source is changing the game of design. This afternoon, we're going to discuss innovation in plastic packaging and the circular economy in Latin America. We hope to see you there. And don't forget, use the hashtag ThinkDiff on Twitter to comment and ask any questions. You can catch up at anything you missed and find the full schedule at thinkdiff.co or on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Lou. Do be sure to check out all of those sessions and more. Don't forget you can catch up on everything at thinkdiff.co. DK, um, we've had a question in, um, actually online, and it's a question I also wanted to ask, which was, what was the biggest challenge in getting this, a project like this off the ground? I mean, you've talked a bit about how it, the sort of scope of it is, you know, it's, it's quite multi-layered. Um, you know, what was the hardest conversation you had? What was the mo what's the most difficult part about working um, with the different mix of people that you're working with? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. And I, I feel like immediately I have two responses. I mean, so I think the first one, which uh, in some ways we've had some success with. So, I mean, to start, um, if you Google Agrobluchy and you look at the kind of uh, sort of articles out there and the imagery, um, it's a super notorious place in in Ghana. And so trying to get young people who, let's say are university students to go there, um, at the very, very beginning, they were like, no way. Like that's the last place on earth they would wanna go. Um, you know, especially, you know, sometimes we had students who, you know, maybe they were getting a master's or, you know, it's a very privileged sort of, uh, milestone in, in society to have, you know, a university degree. And so with that degree to then go and step in this like super dirty place that there's all these narratives around crime and like, it's just a really, really bad place to go to. Um, a lot of people were very reluctant to do that. So, you know, and that's why in a way from the very beginning, part of the way we approached this was because the goal of this project is not just to produce like a business that makes things and sells them to people or to devise some new sort of shiny product that we can, you know, market, but it's actually about trying to imagine alternative futures and to sort of empower, um, you know, many young people to realize what can happen if they can work together and collaborate to transform their environment and to try to think beyond pollution. So we understood that because in reality, the scrapyard was so toxic and it's actually not a place where people should be living. Even though there's thousands of people living around it and working around it, it's not really a place given its levels of pollution that's fit for human life. 
And so we realized that what else is a place that's not fit for human life? You know, other planets. And so in a way we sort of took that as an opportunity to embark on an idea of saying, how can we think about terraforming this environment? How can we take this incredibly toxic, highly polluted environment and rehabilitate it? And how can we make it sort of green again in a place where plants can live and animals can live and insects and all kinds of life forms and people um, together and sort of in harmony in a way that can somehow restore um, you know, what really should be there. And so that was a kind of initial starting point and that's why the maker space that we've been developing over these years now, and we've, we've deployed several of them, um, but why we call them spacecraft, because it's a, it's a, it's a space where you can craft together with other people, but also it's this idea of, of crafting space and how do you actually um, you know, use your hands and digital tools and collaborative kind of technologies to remake your environment and to retrofit these env environmentally polluted places to be a little bit healthier again. So that's one way that we tried to approach it and it's, it's had some degrees of success. Um, and that's, yeah, that's something that we can talk about more, but that's, that was one of the challenges. And, and I want to, I mean, we've had a question specifically about it, which is, you know, what's the goal of, uh, or vision for a project like AMP, or AMP, sorry. Um, and you kind of hinted at it there. I just wondered if we might pull out, what's the, what, what, you know, what's the three, five year picture for a project like this? What, what do you hope it will achieve? Well, it's great. So that was, I said that there were two things in terms of challenges, and that was the other challenge is that, everyone always wants to know like a very simple, clear, you know, you know, one bullet point answer, when in reality, um, it's very manifold. Um, but I guess, you know, ultimately, it's about trying to create a platform for as many young people as possible, sort of these new generations of Africans to be empowered to help build more environmentally responsible systems um, across the continent. So, so to not just sort of make, to sort of focus on transitioning people from consumers to makers and producers, but to really empower um, a very specific type of making, which is collaborative um, around sharing, around uh, commons-based approaches of knowledge commons, uh, equipment's commons, but sharing resources and sharing opportunities together to amplify as much as possible um, what people can do to, to really transform um, you know, the future of the continent to be a little bit greener. And what that translates to in sort of very sort of, I don't know, concrete terms is that the makerspace that we've been developing over the last few years, again, we call it the spacecraft. Um, this is an open source uh, design where the blueprint is available to anyone and everyone online. And we're developing right now um, a sort of graphic manual that people can use even if they can't read or write, but just sort of pictorially um, to enable people to make their own makerspace in their own community um, at the kind of price point that people can afford, which means essentially dirt cheap <laughs> and you can make it sort of out of what's available or even including some scrap and repurposed materials. And so the vision for that is to be able to really um, deploy a fleet of these spacecraft across the continent, which can be networked together um, and support collaborative making um, across the continent. I was going to ask you a bit about open source as a topic that sits over this in general, because I got the sense when you were talking about some of these activities that, I mean, the ability to sort of self-teach yourself to unmake something and then remake a, something like a piece of electronic equipment, like a computer, for example, relies on, I mean, uh, the information is so valuable, right? Information is almost gold, the knowing what's in, what components, what parts go into that computer. Um, and, and obviously it seems like it's an important thing, but based on the fact that you're looking to try and make your uh, spacecraft make a space replicable is that is that fair to say yeah yeah i mean it, it's 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 exactly i mean the approach i mean the future is not like the past and i mean if you teach young people today you'll see that you know if you start talking blah 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 about whatever and they have access to the internet 
they're just going to go to the internet because they can find almost anything that they want to know there. And you can share what you're doing and collaborate with other people. So the future is inevitably much more collaborative because there's sort of new tools that are massively scalable to, to enable that kind of collaboration. So, um, you know, we consider it very important in the context of Africa to think about what open source can mean um, from the bottom up, from the grassroots. And we're very much focused on, yeah, exactly, making a sort of tool set um, that can be accessible to people um, to make themselves um, as a way of making sure that that innovation is inclusive. Well, you know, there's something about that. The future is inherently collaborative that's very inspiring. Um, we are actually pushing up on our time. There's a couple of still big questions I'd like to ask you. I think there's something that I want to insinuate sort of from what you're saying, which is this, it feels that you're inherently talking as much about like a technical solution as a sort of cultural shift or a, a shift in the way in which communities behave. And um, it's more about uh, embedding knowledge and skills and ways of working and behaving as opposed to this is the solution that will generate um, new value in Ghana for you know X amount of years. Is I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? I think so. So I mean, um, you know, is it a, is it a technical solution or is it sort of like a people powered solution? I mean, we actually see it very much sort of at the nexus of these things. Um, and you know, the reason why is that um, if you work in sort of you know the so-called sort of international development space. There are countless stories of, you know, people like to talk about things that are parachuted in. You know, you bring in some technical solution from, it might as well be outer space, and you sort of deploy it in a village or a town or a city. And um, it's there's an expectation that there's something inherent in that technology which will lead to transformation. And sometimes on paper, that can be true, but invariably what happens is that that thing breaks or that, that thing gets full of dust <laughs> from the hamatan or uh, it gets full of water from the humidity during the rainy season or termites or insects. I mean, you know, people talk about what it means to tropicalize something. The environment can be very aggressive um, or people don't know how to use it and it breaks. And then what happens? You need another pot of money to fly in some technical person to try and fix it or send it out or bring a new one. And a lot of these things fall off. And if you visit them after one year, two year, five year, 10 years, the sort of promised results are not there. And so that's why sort of our approach is in a way the opposite, which is saying, instead of trying to bring something in and say, this is going to change everything, um, we're focused on the very long term process of building up capacity to make things from scratch yourself. And so that's why the makerspace, everything we've done uh, was made from scratch um, as much as possible using scrap or materials from the scrapyard or immediately available, or when we had to use steel using made in Ghana steel to build up a local capacity so that everything that you're making, you know how to make it. And if you know how to make it, if it breaks, you know how to re remake it, you know how to repair it. So for us, we see if we want to think about a different type of sort of technology culture, which is very widely distributed across society, then we have to make sure that many, many people are participants in that and that the knowledge itself is very distributed. If that happens, then the so-called sort of technical solutions can be made by many people. It struck me as you were speaking that actually some of those technical, many of those technical solutions are probably ending up in places like Agla <laughs> Loshi. Um, my final question kind of touched a little bit on that. You know, what's the solution? I mean, there's the a few viewers who uh, have asked questions kind of along these lines, and I guess someone watching this at home might be thinking to themselves, well, ultimately, what we're talking about here is repurposing waste or reutilizing waste, which we kind of want to avoid in the first place. We want to avoid having these scrapyards where stuff is is dumped, and then, you know, the, obviously there's an entrepreneurial opportunity that we're now seeing exploited. Um, you mentioned earlier about, well, what if the, you know, a better recycling infrastructure is introduced in certain cities? There's a question about what if some of these technologies that are designed, currently often designed in, uh, in the global north, are designed in such a way that they don't become useless or obsolescent, you know, there's no planned obsolescence. 
where where does this story sit in that solution space? Um, you know, is it is it actually the case that we want to design out these entrepreneurial opportunities in the long term, or is there always going to be a space for this kind of activity? Or you know, uh, where, where do you see that that playing? Perfect. So I mean, I, I see this in a way as an extension of the last question. You know, sort of technical solutions or some kind of a social or cultural um, approach. So you know, we have talked about in a way the framework for the project, the Agilution Makerspace platform project as Sankofa innovation. And, and Sankofa is a kind of concept in the Akan peoples. Uh, it's an Adinkra symbol. And it means sort of that in order to um, sort of move forward or have a sort of productive future, you have to learn from the past or in a way access the knowledge of the ancestors. And we talk about that very much in the context of innovation because so often people are focused on well, the future is, is different. We have to just focus on the future. And I even just said it. But at the same time, if we want to move into the future, we need to understand the knowledge that has existed in the past and understand how that can inform the future. And I'll give you two examples, one from uh, sort of Kenya, one from Nigeria. But, you know, this happens all across Africa. Um, I lived for a number of years in sort of eastern Nigeria, in a sort of small, essentially village context in, in essentially the forest. And everyone had a plantain tree behind their house. And when they had waste, they would throw it at the base of the plantain tree. And sometimes you would find that they would throw their plastic waste there as well, which obviously doesn't biodegrade and is problematic. But why is it that people throw all of their waste at the, their sort of household kitchen waste at the base of this plantain tree? Because historically over time, people knew that it would degrade back into the soil. It would feed the plants and it would enrich the soil and then they would be able to eat the plantains that grow from the tree, right? So there was a very clear understanding that what you were using had some form of sort of sort of outputs that you couldn't use anymore, you know, the skin of a banana, of cassava, yam peels, but that those still had value and that you could recycle them back into your immediate context. Similarly, in Kenya, there's stories of, you know, everyone historically would keep their old iron, they would keep their own metal. When a when a, a farming implement wore down or a cutlass or machete got dull and became really just a hunk of metal, it was never discarded. It was kept and you would bring it back to the blacksmith and they would rework it back into a new tool, right? So there are very sort of relevant understandings about how we're supposed to engage with things that we use, which can inform these futures. So when people say, well, if products are designed so that there's no waste, will that then make a place like Agobushi irrelevant? I don't think so, because at its core, places like Agobushi are these outposts where the knowledge still exists, that there's always cycles and that making is a process of making and remaking and unmaking. And these are kind of spaces or ecosystems uh, or maker communities where that can be enabled. Um, thank you so much for that, DK. One final question is just coming from the viewers, which is a nice one to end on, I guess, is you know, how can people support your work, find out more? get involved, um, you know, are there places they can go or things they can do? Uh, well, sure. I mean, you can, you know, email us, find us on social media and just reach out. I mean, lots of people have, and I should say thank you to all those people. It's really amazing to get these emails of support from all over the world um, or people that send support to try and um, enable sort of the work that we're doing. I will mention that, like I said, we've been developing this, the new manual, which we'll be launching um uh in the next few months like i said we the first makerspace has been active in accra we're actually about to sort of unmake it and then redeploy it elsewhere in the scrapyard uh we've just added another another space to actually be able to build the spacecraft on demand within this um grassroots maker community in accra so if you're in ghana and you're just interested in getting involved reach out to us we'd love to work with sort of local makers to supply you um, we've also been able to deploy a, a, a spacecraft now in Dakar in Senegal, which has moved a bit around as a kind of pop-up fab lab and are in conversations with other people. So reach out to us. I mean, the website right now is, is camp.net, Q-A-M-P.net. Um, and like I said, we'll have new content that content there very soon, but you can get um, a little bit more information on what we've been doing, go through the blog and you can see some of the kinds of workshops that I've been talking about. Um, and yeah, definitely reach out and we'd love to collaborate and like we say, make more and better together. 
Thank you so much, DK, for your time um, this afternoon and for joining us. And thank you so much to you at home who have been sending in your questions and comments. Um, the diff really only exists because of you, so thank you so much for your participation. What I take from this session is that making, unmaking, remaking, they're such critical skills that build up our society and this notion that uh, you know we're developing solutions that sit at that nexus between people powered and technical um, is what makes this story so inspiring. Um, this has been the diff. We have got a session uh, starting up shortly after this about biochar which is considered to be one of the top 100 ideas to mitigate climate change. Um, we, so definitely don't miss that session. Just tune in right after this one. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again at the diff. We need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change.